Welcome to Flipping the Table's final episode of 2022. It is a celebration at the conclusion of a year, which has seen many important gains by the good food movement here in California and across the nation. In this episode, Michael has a conversation with Melanie Wong, Orrin Hesterman, Susan Clark, and Tiffany Nuremberg, who have all had an important impact on Roots of Change over its 20-year history. They explore what has transpired and what can be learned from its experience. Enjoy the show. Hello. I'm pleased to offer this final 2022 episode of Flipping the Table, which is a look back at the first 20 years in the life of Roots of Change, which we abbreviate as ROC, the organization I lead and which hosts this podcast. The Roots of ROC actually go back even longer than 20 years and grew out of the concerns of philanthropists that felt their efforts to transform the industrial food system were falling short of intended outcomes. The name Roots of Change emerged from a March 2001 report issued by 12 foundations that had formed the Funders Agricultural Working Group. The report was meant as a catalyst to inspire or compel California's food and farm industry and policymakers to intensify efforts to address the ecological, public health, and social ills resulting from the industrial approach to production of food. By 2002, the Funders Agricultural Working Group had become the Roots of Change Fund, a philanthropic intermediary which had been increased in size and power by the addition of the Michigan-based W.K. Kellogg Foundation, which shared very similar goals at a national level. The fund quickly created the Roots of Change Council, a group of noted advisors that conceived a strategy with some initial grants that sparked actions in evolution that has resulted in the ROC organization today. I became involved in 2004 when I was running Ag Innovations Network, a nonprofit which was one of the first three grantees of the ROC Fund. And I was hired by the fund to become its executive director in 2006, which is 16 years ago now. So today I am pleased to share my conversation with four individuals who have been instrumental in the formation and evolution of ROC. We will reflect on why it was created, what has worked, what has not worked, and what we hope might transpire with Roots of Change and the larger movement to transform the food system into an engine for solving a host of challenges faced in this century. In alphabetical order, my guests are Melanie Wong, who had a successful career in the pharmaceutical industry before her passion for food led her to become a noted commentator about food and restaurants in the digital space. She then became a consumer activist and a member of California's Nutrition and Fitness Collaborative of the Central Coast, where she chairs the Healthy Food Access Committee. She is also the co-coordinator of the California Food Policy Council, which was spawned with funding and staff support from Roots of Change back in 2011. Orrin Hesterman is the founder and CEO of Fair Food Network and a respected partner for policymakers, philanthropic leaders, and advocates, and a pioneer in building the good food movement. Prior to Fair Food Network, Orrin was the director of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation's Integrated Farming Systems and Food and Society Programs, where he seeded the local food systems movement with more than $200 million in investments. Susan Clark has been a philanthropic executive for nearly 40 years and among the first to focus philanthropy on food system change and strengthening democracy. She was executive director of the innovative and groundbreaking Columbia Foundation and now in semi-retirement, she continues to advise both the Gaia Fund and the RK Foundation. Susan, along with Oren and Bruce Hirsch of the Clarence E. Heller Foundation, were the founders and core contributors to the Rock Roots of Change Fund. Tiffany Nuremberg is Director of Programs for Zero Food Print. She organizes restaurants and food and beverage businesses to restore our climate by funding farmers' transition to regenerative agricultural practices. And for many years, Tiffany worked 
as Roots of Change, Act Roots of Change, where she built and facilitated the California Food Policy Council and led our Urban and Rural Roundtable program. So with that, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Great to see you all here for this special podcast on the, mm-hmm. the 20th year of Roots of Change. You've all had a big impact on Roots of Change over the years, so I'm really pleased that you're you're with me here today to have this conversation. So why don't we just dive in? Actually, Susan, I want to start with you because uh, I think you were one of the original conceivers of this whole thing with Bruce Hirsch. You know, how did you become involved with Roots of Change? What was the what was the roots of your involvement to this whole thing? Well, in 1979, I started working for Columbia Foundation, and I soon realized that I was working for a board of people who were very knowledgeable about environmental issues and even about agriculture, going back to the early days of Columbia Foundation in 1940. And uh, also the trustees, Madeline Haas Russell, raised her own food. So there was a lot of knowledge I came to the foundation with an interest in agriculture because I went to Berkeley and I used to drive down to see my parents in San Diego down 99. And over the years, I watched the insects disappear. And I didn't think about agriculture in those days, but I thought about the birds because I stopped Mm -hmm. having to clean my window shield from insects. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if they're dying, what's happening to anyhow? So those two things came together. And then the third thing that happened was Alf Heller called me and said, there's a program at Santa Cruz that we need to go look at. When that happened, that uh, then the Madeline Haas Russell went down with me, as did Alice Russell Shapiro. And we went down with Alf, I think, and met Steve Gleesman. And at that point, they approved the largest grant that Columbia had ever made which at that time was $250,000. Alf put in $250,000. Huey Johnson put $250,000 in from the California License Plate Fund. So that was my introduction, getting the agroecology program protected from the political winds of the university system. And after that, for years and years, we funded lots of good things, mostly in the, you know, pesticide world, you know, NRDC, the Aller fight, Pesticide Action Net, California for Pesticides Reform. And one day Bruce Hirsch called and said, you know, we can keep funding these individual projects, but maybe we should have a discussion about the whole system. Bruce convened the first discussion of some like-minded people. And from that, we formed the Foundation Agricultural Working Group. We worked for several years together, consulting with people, published a report in 2000, which was called Roots of Change. And by 2022, we thought we needed a larger council that would look at the whole system and try to think about what would be the levers for systemic reform. That's how I got involved. Wow. And then Oren came in. I would like Oren to speak to that. Yeah, Oren. So how did you get hooked up with this thing? Well, Susan, it's... it's, uh... Wonderful hearing about how the project at UC Santa Cruz had such an impact and influence on you and your philanthropy. I was a student at UC Santa Cruz starting in 1970, and I was one of the group that actually broke ground to establish that 17-acre farm and plant the heirloom apple trees that are still bearing there. And that's really where I got my start in this career as a young man, Mm -hmm. realizing that that we needed to figure out how we're going to feed ourselves in the future in a way that was going to be in harmony with the earth, in harmony with each other. And we saw that it was possible to do things differently. So, you know, that that was really at the roots of my change as a you know young professional, mm-hmm. of course, went on, you know, into a career in academia, into a career as an entrepreneur. But I really learned about Roots of Change project before it was Roots of Change. And it was the Foundation Agricultural Working Group out in California, because I had then joined the W.K. Kellogg Foundation back in 1991. You know, Kellogg Foundation had not done any any real funding work in sustainable agriculture. The founder, W.K. Kellogg, had had done work in uh, conservation on land that he owned in near Battle Creek, Michigan. But really, uh, I was tasked with the job when I came to Kellogg Foundation in the early 90s to figure out how Kellogg could actually get involved in this field, this emerging field that we were calling sustainable agriculture. 
And I, I have always believed that none of us can do this kind of big work by ourselves. I didn't believe it when we were at the farm in Santa Cruz back then. I don't believe it now. And I didn't believe it then. And it, it reminds me of a, a quote that I heard when I was at my first Bioneers conference out in Marin County many years ago, and it just has stuck with me. And it goes like this, to, to heal any system, connect it to more of itself. If you want to heal any system, connect it to more of itself. And it just seemed like what Susan and Bruce started doing in California was figuring out how to connect the food and agriculture system in California to more of itself. And I really, uh, I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to learn from it. And I knew that if we were going to make any progress, significant progress, meaningful progress at Kellogg Foundation, we had to get involved in these kind of collaborations, whether it was the environmental working group early on, the sustainable agriculture and food systems funders, or this effort in California. And of course, being from California, I've always held, even though I'm a Michigander now, I've always held a very soft spot in my heart mm -hmm. for California. So it just was a natural for me to accept Susan and Bruce's invitation to come and meet. And the more I learned about what they were doing, the more I thought Kellogg Foundation needs to be involved with this. Well, it was transformative because with you and Heller and, and Columbia together, we were able to bring a lot of additional partners in to get the fund going. And then that allowed us to build a staff. I got hired after the initial three grants, which I talked about in the introduction. And and then uh, eventually, Tiffany, you came on board next. How did you mm -hmm. get involved? Yeah, definitely. So I would say there's also a slight Santa Cruz connection there. I lived uh, my last <laughs> quarter at Santa Cruz, only, you know, maybe a thousand meters from the farm. Um, and that was one of my introductions into food systems and the power and possibility of that. Um, I was actually getting a PhD in history at UCLA, um, looking at transnational feminist movements, the history of the first birth control pills, and realized that I was spending more of my time volunteering um, on causes that I was on research. So I decided to take a little bit of time off and focus on organizing and see if that was something that was actually better suited to me. And I began that work really working with Planned Parenthood and women's health, um, and then transitioned into doing kind of a bunch of different jobs across um you know, kind of progressive causes. And I really found food because of those introductions through farmers markets, through being by the farm at Santa Cruz, through other things as something that was foundational that really let me work on all of the things that I was interested in, human health, the environment, and also coming out of work and reproductive choice, finding a space where Think the lines weren't as, or the trenches weren't dug as deeply um, and where there was People crossed different lines and were a little bit more creative in terms of solutions. It was a movement that was still, I think, forming and that the politics didn't form as usual. So those were all things that attracted me to the food movement and a little bit of that attraction and also happenstance, trying to move from Southern California to Northern California. I applied for a job at this group, Roots of Change, and I don't know that I fully understood what they did. I don't know still if I fully understand, you know, like the whole picture of what Roots of Change is. But it took a couple of tries, but eventually started working um, with you, Michael, at first in kind of communications and then network building, program management, and getting to facilitate these deep collaborations that have been a part of Roots of Change um, and its work from the from the beginning. Great. And then Melanie. So then you came into the world. How'd that happen? Yeah, so actually today I, I uh, went back to find uh, where was the first that I'd heard about Roots of Change, and it was actually an email from Tiffany um, uh, from mm -hmm. in uh, June, inviting me to a convening in June of 2011 to meet with uh, Secretary uh, of CDFA Karen Ross and with um, Secretary Dooley of Health Services in Sacramento. And so mm -hmm. my group here in the Salinas Valley, actually in Monterey County, which is based out of the Monterey County Health Department, but also touches Santa Cruz County and uh, San Benito County for a tri-county uh, Central Coast uh, reach, um, nominated me to be the person to go. They wanted me to be the spokesperson to really bring together the idea uh, because of my healthcare background and my deep interest in food and my connection to the Salinas Valley being a fifth generation Californian to represent them in Sacramento. And it was eye-opening because, I mean, here in Salinas, I'm certainly a big fish in a little pond. And then to go to Sacramento and meet people who'd been doing food policy work for 
many years and actually big P policy work versus, Mm -hmm. you know, your local programmatic kinds of things that many of your local organizations tend to do was in at that time, uh, that convening was more like a debating society. And so I was very quiet about and needed to needed to learn. But I'm really grateful for having had that uh, exposure in being able to bring Salinas Valley's agricultural interests, some of the advances that we've made here in terms of pesticides alerts, uh, where the health department's been involved in farm worker health and some of the long-term studies. And then also just my interest in food. I mean, I had been working with this group for about, see, 2011, I'd been working for about five years, having been radicalized by the effort in um, 2006, 2007 to get food trucks off the streets of Salinas. And so I had sort of led that campaign and really used the privilege as a long time. My family has been here in Salinas for a long time that I could speak for people who couldn't speak for themselves uh, at city council meetings. And that just really showed me that constituents have to show up. And so that's one of the biggest lessons that I've had out of trying to do this work. Well, you've all had very important impacts in different ways. So I'm going to throw out a second question here from your different perspectives, because you have some some very long perspectives, some kind of midterm perspectives, and some more recent perspectives. Susan, in what ways has Roots of Change done what you hoped it would do? And in what ways has it not? Because I think that's just as important in trying to understand you know, and learn from, from its evolution about, about movements. Roots of Change recently has had a lot more success, but the big money has not come to the table in productive ways. We do not have in this field the kind of money to make the kind of change we need. And that has, I mean, I know there are a lot more funders coming to the table, but they're not really doing systemic change as far as I can see. And I've been very disappointed in that, in philanthropy, basically. Not in the Roots of Change Fund, because I think it tried very hard, but that's one thing we did not achieve. The second thing is, I I don't consider myself so much a food movement person as an ag person. I may have learned that from Oren, but our interest, both at Gaia Fund and earlier at Columbia Foundation, always focused on the on-farm production systems as what needed to be changed. But once we understood what needed to be changed there, of course, it was the marketing, it was the market access, the infrastructure for the whole thing. But the goal was to see a transition from the toxic brew agriculture that existed in California and still does to a dream that if by California would really mean something. It would mean you're buying organic and it would be organic the entire state. Now, that was actually my dream that we would we would achieve that. And um, all right. So that's that's the things that haven't happened. I think the toxicity in ag is as much as it ever was. And uh, of course, worldwide, it's increased tremendously over the years that I've been working what Roots of Change has done that has been, I think, very productive is links with food policy councils, with policy leaders, with community leaders from human services, from other areas, and kind of bringing that all together for food system work, which I think has been extremely important for the state. I think it's gotten the attention of the state. I want to see more movement in agriculture. That's my, Mm -hmm. in toxics, getting poisons out of the food system. Great. So Oren, how about you? I know, and you made a choice to leave philanthropy and create your own nonprofit, Fair Food Network. So I'm curious if you could fold that into your response to this, because that, that obviously was a decision you made, a strategic decision about how you wanted to participate in this world. You know, the, some of the work with Roots of Change and the collaboration we had going on helped inform that. But, you know, first, I I might just say that I have this very interesting relationship with California, right? I grew up in California. It's still home to me. My my family of origin are all still out there, three generations, right? So I really, I so understand in a way and appreciate the kind of forward movement that can come from California. And so I, I, 
I continue to believe how necessary it is for this kind of collaborative work to be happening in California. At the same time, I'm now a solid Midwesterner, and I see how folks in the Midwest view California. Mm. And so in some ways, uh, you have to be a little careful because there are times where, oh, well, that they may be able to do it out there in the West, but it, that sort of doesn't come past the Sierra Nevadas. And, and so, you know, we're not going to pay that much attention to what's happening in California. So there's this mixture, mm -hmm. the sort of pros and cons about like, yes, we need to keep the forward momentum happening in California. And we have to figure out ways that that can inform and be informed by what's happening in the rest of the country. You know, I, I remember well this vivid picture project that, that we supported very early on. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what really held the promise. It was like this looking at really like the first time I had ever seen somebody really try to encompass the whole array of food and agriculture systems in California and say, okay, if we're going to, like you said, Susan, if we're going to have an impact, you've got to be looking at this as a system. You can't look at just one part. And while the sentiment to do that is great and we need to keep pushing it, the amount, the, the ability for us mortal humans to be able to actually work on that level is difficult. Mm -hmm. Probably part of the reason that I have really enjoyed and thrived actually working in the in the nonprofit sector with a with a you know nonprofit that I've been leading versus philanthropy is because in philanthropy, while you get to do good stuff by giving away money, you never really do anything. All you do is give away the money. And you have to trust that other people are going to get the work done. Oftentimes I got frustrated because I said, oh my God, if they just worked with each other, if they looked at this, if they did this, how much more impact could they have? So I figured at some point I better put my uh, my money where my mouth is, or maybe my lack of money if I move from the <laughs> philanthropic world where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. and, and what I really, one thing, Michael, I really appreciate about the content, you know, the the connection, the thread with Roots of Change is the relationship that that we had with Gus Schumacher yeah. and how he yes. helped connect the nutrition incentive work that he saw happening initially on the East Coast, connecting it to me in the Midwest at Kellogg and now and then with Fair Food Network and connecting it to what was happening in California. Yep. And some of the most, to me, some of the most powerful policy changes, big P policy changes that we've seen have to do with shifting how nutrition assistance money is getting spent and going to be spent because it's the largest, by far the largest single budget item in our entire federal agricultural policy is SNAP. And how we leverage those dollars to enable families to create greater health for their kids while supporting local agriculture and farming and while keeping those food dollars in the local economy to build local economies, it, it, it actually is working. We now have enough evidence over time that this actually does work on all three of those levels. And without Gus helping us move this forward by connecting California and Roots of Change with uh, others of us around the country, it may not have happened. Yeah, that was a really important thing. Gus had been USDA undersecretary in the Clinton administration and then uh, was an advisor to you at, and, and to Roots of Change and, and helped us create that. And then we created an analog here in California. I was just meeting with the Secretary of Agriculture yesterday talking about that program here in California and how we're going to keep it funded given the budget crisis mm -hmm. that's emerging now. So yeah, that was a really important thing. And the other thing I just want to say off the two of your comments that Roots of Change, what you said, it's, it's very hard to work the whole system. And we realized early on, and this will be a good link to the two of you, um, Tiffany and Melanie, we realized we had to actually create networks and work with a lot of other people in order to build power to have an impact because it is so big and none of us can grok it all and have enough expertise to really be useful in all the spaces. So we had to build networks. And uh, so, Tiffany, how about you? What, what did you see about what we set out to do and what we have and haven't done? 
Yeah, I really appreciate Oren. You just set me up for this quite well because my colleague uh, Leo at the organization I work with, Zero Foodprint, is today um, at Solidarity Farm working with Ellie Igo, who was the person that launched the nutrition incentive programs at the City Heights Farmers Market and worked very hard with Gus. They're doing a press conference for a grant that um, is coming in from the USDA in terms of working with small farms that have kind of come up from those groups of people to really work on regenerative agriculture, compost, um, and expanding this work. And so I think that for me, the most successful part of Roots of Change, the piece that is most evident at every day in the work that I do really is the concept that I was introduced to by you, Michael, like the knitting of the network, right? And just the, um, the early work that I was a part of with the urban rural roundtables connecting city leaders and country leaders and then working with policymakers. You know, our governor, Gavin Newsom, was a, the first group that we did that with, happened in San Francisco, created a policy that's now informing, I think, his and his team's understanding of agriculture, how these things connect and relate. So we're seeing that kind of trickle up through policy, as well as our the fellows groups and the people that work together who work people at the top of their careers, the middle of their careers, just beginning their careers, who were able to understand the nuance and the complexity of the system by being forced and having the opportunity to sit next to someone, have a conversation with someone, learn about something that they would never have just by coming up as activists or just by working as organizations. I mean, for me, the personal learning that came not only from those conversations, but from going on journeys along with, we had a group of fellows based in Fresno and really trying to understand the food system as it existed at the heart of industrial agriculture in California and the pieces that nobody knows exist. The people who work in dark rooms, inspecting fruits to make in with black lights, making sure that there is no mold and like the working conditions that happen there, how long something sits in storage. It really just was like mind blowing for them. And I think the the knowledge that was created and then shared through those networks has really been like the lasting legacy. And I know that, you know, with the two funders, previous funders on the group, which is often like nearly impossible to get funding for. Um, like there's not, it's hard to evaluate. There aren't metrics for that, but like that is what I see reaping benefits over and over and over again. Like the worlds that we were connected to, the people who have come in through the food policy councils who have then spread out, it's like a movement that is maturing. Um, and that has brought us to a point where I feel like, you know, regardless of some of the challenges with not getting the toxicity out of the system. But I think that the momentum that we hear about with regenerative, the conversation that we see in terms of the agriculture world, the money that's coming in from the federal government now is happening at a speed that I have not seen in my time of involvement. And I think that all of this network knitting has been crucial um, to building a movement that could get that, those le that level of resources and hopefully um, is able to use that to really move us forward. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base, which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. Yeah, let me just comment on this. Mm -hmm about the 60 Roots of Change fellows in three mm -hmm. different classes. One of them is now the undersecretary at USDA, Jenny Lester Moffitt. Mm -hmm. She was in our first class of fellows. She now runs the Ag Marketing and Regulatory Service mm -hmm. and has been instrumental in investing in, in food system infrastructure and mm -hmm. uh, community food systems. I mean, it's, it's really amazing how these things do over time have an impact. So Melanie, how about you? Tiffany, I would echo everything that you said about network building. And the difficult thing is that, you know, when we talk to funders, they want to fund programs. And this network building is just this really soft resource of people that are at the ready when they're needed, you know, when, um, when we can put them together. And I get requests constantly of like, who's doing this work? And some are, do you know anybody in the state? Do you know anyone in the country, you know, who is doing this kind of work? And, um, but that's not something that we ever get compensated for, for maintaining those ties and having those connections and being part of these, you know, various groups where we um, try to talk to each other. Um, and 
I think that that's, you know, one of the, that's one of the hardest um, things about what, how can food policy councils be sustainable going forward? Um, They obviously are serving a purpose of civic discourse. I mean, it's one of the few places that everyone is welcome, you know, and I would say particularly because I'm here in the Salinas Valley where we have, you know, dramatically different viewpoints, even though, you know, this is now, Democrat country, uh, there still are some very conservative interests here. And we need to accommodate and we need to compromise. And that's really at the heart of how we move forward and how we come up with long lasting solutions, not just cramming something down someone's throat today that gets turned, uh, you know, overturned a year or two later. You know, I'm excited about the amount of money that's coming in. And we're trying to say, how do we, you know, who within our network can take advantage of this? We're, you know, looking more at regional solutions, you know, regional food systems, uh, particularly here on the central coast. I mean, we have the six counties. I've worked intensively with the three, uh, but now we're looping in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara County and Ventura County to a certain extent as well, uh, because agriculture is primary for all of us. We're on this coastline. We have this beautiful fisheries that has had a, a major success with the ground fish recovery. You know, it's an, an investment. It's a, it's a sacrifice that our fishers made, you know, over the last, you know, almost 10 years. And it's been a tremendous success. And we want them to be able to profit from that. You know, they they were good stewards and and put up with that in the cut in their livelihood. So um hey, I was going to say that one of the things that we really focused on was regionalization. We held you may remember we brought yes. Kevin Newsom to come and talk about food sheds in 2009 when he was running for governor the first time and, and didn't win. But that has been implanted as part of our DNA. Yesterday, I was, mm-hmm. as I mentioned, that meeting uh, at CDFA with the secretary, and we were talking about food system infrastructure and, uh, and the fact that all these different communities around the state are now developing local regional food system plans, mm-hmm. and we need to put them all together and get the state behind it and start investing in the actual infrastructure, the ecosystems of people and institutions and actual physical infrastructure Mm -hmm. to re-regionalize the food system. And that, I think, is the next big thing that will be happening in this state if we can get it off the ground. And and I'm hoping we can. We're going to meet with the governor's office on Friday to start talking. We 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 get referrals from CDFA because they say, talk to your local food policy council. Well, you know, they, they need to shore us up so that we can mm-hmm. continue to do that, that we are, exactly. you know, we're exactly. their trusted partner in the local communities because they're getting a ton of money as well that's coming into them. And they don't, you know, they're challenged to give it away because they don't know who to trust right? and who's, you know, who are these people and what's behind them. And I think that what we've seen with the, the budget surpluses of the last two years in California, the lack of transparency about how that money is being given out and not according to plan. We need to like take a step back now, now that we're in a, you know, that we're regrouping somewhat. This is the time for us to step yeah. back, come up with some good plans about how we think we want the economy of the future to be for food. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say, wasn't Roots of Change involved at the very beginning with starting f- the whole idea of food policy councils throughout California, Los Angeles, San Francisco? Is well, that correct? There had been food cal- policy councils that uh, Berkeley had one, Oakland might Berkeley have been. had one. Mm-hmm. But what we did is Roots of Change Fund invested in building more up and down the state the Central Coast had started its own thing. It wasn't a food policy council, but it was moving in that direction. So what we did okay. is try and stimulate the development of these up and down the state. And we were instrumental in getting the LA Food Policy Council up and going, which is now the largest food policy council in the country. And they have, they've created a national program around purchasing. I, I'm sure you know about it, Oren, uh, mm-hmm. the Good Food Purchasing Program. You're probably associated in some way or linked. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, we, we've we got, we, we're having regular conversations with Paula and mm-hmm. see some very uh, good connections between our impact investing work and yes. the Good Food Purchasing Program. Yeah, that's great. So, so what I'm hearing is that the state needs to make an investment in the food policy councils if they want to really start regionalizing and creating infrastructure that that they can't skip over that step. And I'm, I'm hoping we find a way to get the state to support the food policy councils directly. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that there needs to be private and public mm -hmm. financing um, that food, you know, other states that have a statewide council in addition mm -hmm. to their local ones almost always have funding from their state agriculture department or somewhere else okay. from state funding. Mm -hmm. California does not uh, really in a okay. system, in a regular way. And then at the same time, we as the California Food Policy Council carry the onus that the rest of the country is looking to us. You know, I have very close relationship with the people at Michigan State, you know, and communicate with them regularly, including, you know, mm -hmm. yesterday. They're looking at like, you know, our farmer equity statement and how we are addressing a number of things that are coming up in their states. And we have the onus of being the leaders in that uh, with very little support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no support. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts, Oren? Do you have any thoughts about, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious now moving the conversation a little bit towards the larger food movement, like what's happening in the country, what needs to happen, and what can we learn from the trajectory of Roots of Change, from what Kellogg did with Food and Society, the things that you invested in, what can we learn about what's needed for the future? You want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, one one thing that that really uh, comes to mind after hearing both Tiffany and Melanie speak about you know knitting these networks, you know, you, I know Susan and and Michael will both remember how during my time at Kellogg, we would every year or every six months we were bringing together folks at the Food and Society or the Integrated Farming Systems conferences. Like we were actually was this wrong. idea of of building networks was critically important and. You know, uh, we had to really make a case because, you know, at the foundation, because like this was money we were not going to give out as grants. This is money we were going to spend to bring people together for a week of learning and engaging and relationship building. You know, I, I, I'm very disappointed that that stopped. I mean, it didn't stop because Thank of the you. pandemic, it stopped well before the mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, as we are emerging out of that situation and being able to get together in person again. Uh, you know, this is a service that somebody, so, you know, somebody or some group needs to recreate. We need a rebirthing of this kind of national convening of folks working in this movement. That is how, you know, that's how you mm -hmm. connect a system to more of itself. You can't just talk about it. You got to get people in the room. So much grew out, whether it's food core, farm to school, um, you know, the, the number of of uh, national efforts that just grew out of bringing smart, dedicated, energetic people together who wanted to work together. And that's something that I think is really missing and something that all of us ought to be thinking about how to recreate. Um, yep, that was really important. That was fundamental to my education mm -hmm. and my yeah. linkages across the Mine nation too. were those meetings. They were mm -hmm. fabulous. And, right. um, and, uh, it's, and it's, really, it's really not happening like that anywhere right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, on the on the positive side, you know, uh, while we could spend uh, an entire podcast critiquing the recent White House conference on hunger, nutrition and health and food systems, the fact that there was a national summit, the fact that the White House called this conference the first one in 53 years tells us that the issues we care about and that we're working on it, we've work, been working on it for a long time, are rising to the level of a national conversation, which needs to be happening. So the more we can support uh, those kinds of conversations, so, you know, gathering together as sort of activists and funders of activists and advocates and gathering together, you know, on this sort of larger policy level, these all need to be happening uh, and I'm I'm hoping that we can do more of that that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else have a comment on that? Susan or I would say that from our members, that's the number one thing that they ask for in terms of a service. Mm -hmm. How can we be spending more time together so that we're going to actually increase the number of Zoom meetings that we have? Um, we're going to have we've, we're creating these regional groups so that that you know five or six food policy councils in an area mm -hmm. can get to know each other much more intimately and look at regional issues. Uh, and then you know, and then yesterday I was in a conversation that you know, which is that the Tides Foundation is leading to of how to you know how to get philanthropy to understand food system work. Mm 
And the number one thing that was asked for there was more convenings and, and opportunities for collaboration and network building. So no, that, that's on a national level and on a state level, what I'm hearing. No, that, that's one question I, I want to ask my, my California partners here. In Silicon Valley, more wealth has been created in that place than in the history of the world, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know whether you are seeing any philanthropic tendency among, you know, in that great bastion of wealth towards the kind of work that you all and we all are doing. H has that changed at all? Susan, you go first on that one. I have thoughts, but, and then, and Tiff, you're probably out there working on this. Or and there are mm -hmm. a couple of big donors in the Central Valley who are in the very, in a very non-public way. So you can't really figure out what they're doing. They say mm -hmm. they're interested in the good food movement, but I have mm -hmm. no idea what they're funding mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. very, very private. They're not collaborative. They're not public. So from a perception, I'd have to say no. And the big environmental foundations are still just as in denial as I've always been about agriculture as a solution, mm -hmm. as a positive thing. So that's, Michael, maybe you should add, I'm not current, but that's my impression. Yeah, I, I, I think it's hard. I mean, the one that you might put in that category would be Tomcat the Tomcat Trust, and they have invested in some things, uh, food access things and, and climate smart agriculture mm -hmm. things that we've been involved with. So those, that's really- the School food. School mm -hmm. food, yeah. I don't really see other places where some of those very big funds are putting money. I mean, housing is a big one, I think, and, and there's some other issues. But Tiffany, I mean, what are you seeing? Well, luckily, I tend to insulate myself from the major fundraising questions. I'm primarily working with small businesses to raise money collect with collective action to fund the projects. But I would what I do know and what we've experienced is similar, I think, to what Susan had spoke of. I think there's money coming in, but it's unclear who it's coming from. And um, a lot of it, it's unknown. Um, and so it's there's a little bit of of a mystery. And sometimes money comes and it shows up unexpectedly and you're not uh, sure who exactly it's from. And uh, so it's hard to gain traction or to then kind of go back for consistency or really, I think I don't have a, a clear picture. And that's not just for my organization, but speaking to others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you can't, it's hard to be strategic mm -hmm. if you can't predict. Mm -hmm. I mean, like any business, you get, need mm -hmm. to know your cash flow, yeah. you need to make plans. Um, Oren, I mean, this is what you're incredibly good at. Um, mm -hmm. And and you also developed a way to bring in uh, both investment money and mm -hmm. philanthropic money to the work that you do. So what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. It sort of boggles my mind that with Me that too. kind of concentration of wealth, that seemingly would look at the issues that we care about as something really attractive to them. There hasn't been much of a spigot going into food systems work from there. You know, I, I love the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Funders. Susan and I were two of the people who helped start that organization. I think, Susan, you and I traded off being chair of that steering committee for like a dozen years, you know. Um, we did. And, you know, we used to meet around a, you know, a dining table of the few of us that were funding in this area. It's now, you know, they have conferences that'll, that'll attract several hundred people. Uh, over 100 foundations, yet mm -hmm. mostly they are small foundations. I mean, it's great to see them happening, see it happening, but mostly it's pretty small foundations. I mean, I am starting to be heartened when we start to see Rockefeller Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and some other, you know, the larger philanthropies joining. Doesn't mean they're yet putting a lot of their money into the food systems work, mm -hmm. but they're at least see, they're starting to see there's something there they need to know about. And so they are officially joining up. I mean, I would love to see some of the Silicon Valley foundations and donors, you know, join up in the same way so they can learn more. I'll, I will say this, Robert. So I think one of the nexus, I mean, the, the issues of equity are really important to the big foundations now. They're focused on that. Mm -hmm. We have Robert Wood Johnson. We, we have a project working with farm workers down in Ventura and Kern County. And our partner in Ventura, Cause, which works on farm support, farm worker services and labor 
and and justice, basically environmental justice work, we were we were helpful in getting them a half a million dollar grant from Robert Wood Johnson this last year. And that was a big thing because it's about creating a system for making land available to low income people to grow food and do things in their community. So that was mm-hmm. it was about land rights and land access and the policies that dictate what happens to land in communities. So it's a very interesting thing that they funded and, and, and it showed that they are, as you're suggesting, moving in that direction. Go ahead. Do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I would say with the wildfires in 2017, a group of us quickly established a field operation of emergency food service uh, for Sonoma Valley and that also extended into Napa Valley and up to Mendocino County through the connections and the knowledge that I had learned from working with Roots of Change and food system work. But to tie this to philanthropy, we were able to get money from two of the largest tech companies in the world who are based in the Mid-Peninsula, but they did not want us to identify them. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't want it to be known that they were the ones that that provided the money for this. You know, where we pay, we provided 110,000 meals uh, over a three-month period. But I do think that you know, when we went to visit one of them afterwards, you know, on the Mid Peninsula, they had said that this had changed their thinking about what is their response, what, you know, what could they be doing more in this food space, including, you know, looking at they had an emergency plan for their own employees on their own campus, but they felt like maybe they should be taking a larger responsibility for the adjoining communities. Uh, And we're starting to look at that. Also dealing more with food waste and more food donations because they hadn't done that before. And so that was a big change as well. So I think that, you know, we helped them get their foot in there. I haven't had a chance Mm -hmm. to follow up with them, you know, in the last, you know, during the pandemic. But certainly they, you know, they, they don't, they don't want people, you know, asking them for money in this case, because they don't want it to be known. So yeah, I'm not sure how to change that, Susan. Um, and we're getting we're getting close to wrapping up here. So, Susan, please. Mm-hmm. So, this is a little wrap up comment apropos of my earlier interest in um, field the fields and in getting toxics out of ag. And one of the things you asked earlier, what I'd like to see happen with the food movement in the future, is I'd like to see the food and farming movement connect to the global environmental movement and that's not just cop 27 which is climate Mm -hmm. but cop 15 which i consider even more important the biodiversity convention which Mm -hmm. just completed in montreal they are calling for a i think it's a 75 or 80 percent reduction in pesticide use worldwide as part of the convention now i don't know that it passed but that was on the table that they cannot preserve biodiversity and species life on earth without radical. And I'd like Mm -hmm. to see the food movement take that up and say, we're with that. We want it out. Mm -hmm. Pesticides out. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's Uh, one of my wishes. Uh Uh-huh. Great. Closing comments from each of you. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really interesting point, Susan. You know, if we get focused in the same way as we've been trying to break down silos, I think throughout Roots of Change's history of really bringing people together. You know, we're seeing that even now in the world that we're working in with food and farming. Like we are trying to, I think, driven by like with climate, it's just like we need to be able to sequester greenhouse gases. We need to have some sort of a measurement indicator. And so we're often focused on that when there are many other benefits to regenerative agriculture and trying to figure out how do you both give the complexity of the picture with being able to give people something succinct that they can they can hold on to. Um, and I really think that, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is these problems just feel so complex and so difficult and so overwhelming um, and being able to flip the table on that um, to be able to really show where there is opportunity, where there's movement, give people opportunities to make change in their in their daily lives and to understand the like the many ramifications that those actions can have, but then really how does that, how do those actions connect to policy? How does that connect to systemic change? Like a couple of cents that you're contributing with a meal that then goes to regenerative agriculture may feel something that good that you can do, but then how do we shift that into really shifting the system and creating funding mechanisms that will, um, will move us, like we'll move that needle along. And so I think that's generally where 
the work is right now, especially with money coming into the system. Like, how do we take these these things that we know, these ideas that we've been working on that are are functioning and really scale them up to get the kind of impact that you're looking for? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, what what we're looking towards is is to continue to be um, that resource for capacity building for local actors in the food systems uh, and Talking food, about food council. Council. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's an ongoing thing because the, the stakeholders are changing all the time. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the people that are in this, and so we have to continue to do it, but the promise of being able to mobilize people at your local mm-hmm. level to come out and speak for themselves. And this has actually become mm-hmm. even more important. People had learned to come out and, and contact their elected ref- uh, officials. And mm-hmm. um, we have to have even more numbers to come out to be, to have mm-hmm. our voice be heard. And I think that, uh, you know, that that's really the thing for us to be able to get people to have enough experience and enough mm-hmm. and to become a, a large enough size that when these grants come through of a hundred thousand, mm-hmm. 500,000, that they're ready to take them and they can take advantage of them because we have seen this huge divide in philanthropy between the cities and the rural areas of California. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we need to, we need to do a better job of, uh, of evening out those resources. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking about from this conversation. I was at a meeting uh, last week where somebody who I I won't mention her name, but well known to many of us in the, in this movement, saying how it's not really a movement that some people want to call it a movement, but all it is is like different people doing different things. And it's never, it's not really come together. It's not really a movement. And I, so I've been thinking about that in the context of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's a matter of perspective. You know, we have to understand that not, not, not everybody can be working on every issue. Not every organization can work on every issue, but that doesn't mean that, Together, we can't move a movement forward. Um, what's missing is, you guys called it knitting the networks, mm-hmm. connecting it to more of itself, and doing this kind of convening. So, uh, you know, to me, it's like the, the ingredients are there, but uh, we don't yet have the right mixing bowls and the right implements to actually put this all together into a beautiful meal. I I will say this, that I do see that emerging here. In the last two years, we've been part of two very large collaborations with different players from different parts of the system who come to agreement on what they're requesting from government agencies. And as a consequence, $2 billion flowed to the kinds of things we want to see in this state over the last two years. That is a maturing, moving towards what you're calling for. That is happening because we're all different. There's a meeting today at four o'clock because we have to make some decisions about how we're going to approach the government this year. And we're all different perspectives. And we're trying to come to agreement to get it down to a few requests that, that give us the power required and what i think fantastic but i think you're saying needs to happen at the national level now i mean you know the pandemic helped us a lot because look at what usda has done billions are flowing Mm -hmm. like a huge amount of money and that pandemic connected to what we've been saying for 20 years i think pierced the mind and now Mm -hmm. we just have to more tightly. And I hope someone does. I mean, let's all think about who we could get asked to play that role that Kellogg played because it was fundamentally important. Because I also think that the movement has really expanded and or recognized pieces of the movement that it was not did not see of itself for a long time. Um, And so I think that we really are like the the table is extending, the table is growing and making sure that uh, this new community of Kellogg, which was always at the forefront of it, is really, I think, figuring out how do we, like, we're having lots of conversations and they may not always be the same conversation, but have them happening in parallel, like have them happening together so that we can really see each other for the different roles that we're playing in pro- in the movement that I think that you're talking about, Warren. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we skip past that point where it doesn't need to be a movement, but it's a part of our everyday yeah. life that we are mm-hmm. teaching elementary school children about food mm-hmm. and where their food comes from and how how to live mm-hmm. a healthy life and how to, you know, honor where their food comes from. And uh, it becomes our everyday mm-hmm. life. Yeah. And, and Susan, I want to give you one piece of hope. 
Mm-hmm. Yesterday morning, the Secretary of Agriculture held a meeting with pesticide researchers who came and talked about the impacts on pesticides in soil, which are contributing to climate change. And I have never seen that. And they it was stated the use of a lot of these, particularly fumigants, are adding to climate change, adding to the release of carbon. And there needs to be more research and change around that. And so they're going to have a series of conversations going forward around it. So that was a big breakthrough in my mind because I had never seen that mm-hmm. before. That's been a kind of a scary place. And now it's happening at CDFA. That is good news. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So with that, I want to thank all four of you very much for your time, for your contributions to Root to Change, to the learning, to the larger food movement. You've all been instrumental in making things happen, and I'm grateful, and I'm, I'm really, uh, I feel connected and deeply appreciative. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Great, great to be with you all. Thank you for listening, and thank you to our sponsors, the Ladybug Foundation, Dan and Quincy Imhoff, Beth and Mark Wyatt, Cindy Daniel, and Doug Lipton. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute. 